Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here and to share uh, God's Word with you. Uh, today is going to be something a little, uh, not biological, di- dialogical is what I'm calling it today. I'm, I'm, we're just getting set up over here, and um, John Lalonde is going to join us, join me, and together uh, over the next three Sundays, we're going to share about God's Word. And uh, we're going to share three uh, word pictures uh, that come from Scripture that describe um, what Scripture does in our lives. But an overarching picture uh, comes from Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, we've got the psalmist, you know, getting extremely excited about the Word of God, the truth of God, God's law. And then uh, he concludes that God's um, ordinances and, and laws, he says, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey and honey from the comb. And so this is our, our uh, thought process this, over uh, these three weeks. Uh, if you were remembering, we finished the first third section of Acts. And so we're taking a break. Uh, we're going to talk about God's Word in, uh, the, on the first uh, Sunday of April. We're going to have a a more formal dedication of our uh, church, which the timing of which is really good because uh, I guess the the following week, is it, am I calculating correctly? The following week is Easter, which is our, I think technically our 21st birthday. Is that right? So we finally become an adult church. All right? (laughs) Right? Um, On the 21st. But I want to welcome uh, John Lalonde. You know, uh, I was thinking, John, if we said it, Jean Lalonde, you would have been uh, like a Montreal Canadiens hockey player from the 70s or something. But it's John Lalonde. And I'm going to ask him to introduce himself. I don't think Jeannie's here today, is she? Okay. So, uh, full disclosure, we're both unsupervised today. <laughs> so, so, just so you know. But, John, why don't you, you know, introduce yourself a little bit and you... You have a love for God's Word. Tell us about that. Okay, well, uh, Brent had put down that I should um, uh, have a little uh, introduction. So I thought I would combine two things. Uh, This December of this year, 2023, is an anniversary for me. Uh, That was the day 50 years ago that I was saved. Um, And I want to acknowledge the blessing that I have had through the church, because my ability to stand in front of you today is, uh, I cannot calculate how valuable all of the people involved in my life, all of the men who, who taught me, who mentored me, who prayed for me, uh, who talked with me, have put into my life. I, I stopped when I was preparing, and just off the top of my head, I could name, first and last name, at least 15 people that I could tell you right now, who were vitally important in my development as a believer. And every one of them told me this, read your Bible. It will feed your soul, it will instruct you, it will guide you, it will bring you things, it will bring things to you that you have no idea of. And that it will continually uh, be rich, a rich uh, source for your life. So, thank you. Yeah, I've been enjoying spending time with John. We, um, we've been meeting at Starbucks, and um, uh, John has introduced me to, you know, tea and lemon, lemon loaf, and it's a nice pairing. It brings out lots of notes of uh, calories, I've noticed. Um, so, but it's really um, what I appreciate, what I've appreciated the last few times we've met is you know, just to get together and just talk about how much God's Word means to us, uh, what the insights, the joy of it, and uh, we we need that. And um, and so what we want in this time over the next three weeks is to kind of convey that and and just together celebrate the value of God's Word. And today the word picture that we have in mind is is the biblical word picture of uh, bread, uh, in Matthew 4, in Luke 4, um, Jesus um, talks about the Word of God like bread that feeds us. It's beyond um, a physical 
uh, meal. It's something that nurtures and feeds our, our hearts. And so, as we jump into this, we'll probably use a lot of terms, uh, Bible, Scripture, statutes, precepts. If we, if we go into, if we were to um, survey Psalm 119, we'd find a lot of different terms. I noticed in the translation that we had for our opening um, uh, call to worship, it, it talked about righteous rules. And I'm not uh, that excited about rules, but if they're righteous... Uh, then it does something powerful in my life, and it really plays out uh, this truth that Jesus said, that, that the Word of God is bread, and it, and it feeds us. So we're going to talk about that today. <clears throat> so I'd like to start with a little bit of a thought, of a, thought experiment. Um, for those of you who are familiar with you know, there need no introduction. For those of you who aren't, it's just, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and just think about it personally. I'm not looking for an outright response, although if you have one, please, you know, feel free. Um, so I want you to think about this. First, reflect on your activities and your conversations in this past week, wherever you, you work, you study, or with the people that you're involved with. Now, I'd like you to rank them in order from the most enjoyable to the least enjoyable. You know? And now, I'd like to you to rank them from what you think was the most valuable aspects of those conversations and the least valuable. Now, how many of you have come to the place where you're thinking about the Word of God at all or instructions from the Word of God? Okay. So, <clears throat> I have often, maybe not in that order, but I have often been guided, I think, because I don't think it arises from myself, thought of how often do I see or conceive of the way in which I converse to people, especially shaped by the Word of God. Now, I don't mean uh, reciting it to them or you know, telling them chapter and verse, but does it shape the way I think? Does it, does it change my vocabulary and my approach, especially? Um, one of the things I know that I've dealt with in my life is the, the sense of, I can say the right things, my problem is saying them the right way, in the right attitude, in the right tone, um, things like that. Anyway, let's move on. I would like you to listen to these words and think if this is from Psalm 119 again, if this is what came to mind with your conclusion about that experiment. You, this is the psalmist talking to God, you are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Now listen carefully to the pairing here. It was good for me to be afflicted that I might learn your decrees. For the law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Do we think that about the Bible? Sadly, I don't think I have got there yet. I'm working on that one. 50 years may seem like a long time, but uh, when all of humanity is considered but a breath to God, I don't think it's even a start. As uh, we were preparing, I came across this um, quote from Timothy Keller. And one of the things that is on our heart is that um, we don't just talk about um, just a textbook for Christ Christianity, you know, but it's, it's a, a living uh, reality for our lives. Um, Keller says this, God speaking and acting are the same thing. His word is his action, his divine power. So as we talk about a principle from Scripture or the value of Scripture, we're not talking about something that's inert, but it's actually to be active in our lives. And so our first main thought today is that the Bible actually nourishes us. In uh, John 6, verse 27, Jesus used a very interesting phrase. He talked about... Uh, the need to work for food that endures for eternal life. And we have a lot of pursuits, obviously, in our world today 
that um, will endure for something. Um, we're told, uh, especially people my age, we're told to you know, do a, take a lot of steps so that uh, retirement will be comfortable, right? To have a re really comfortable retirement. And I think, uh, you know, back when my parents were at my age now, they just had to get a, a, a bit of a nest egg together. But now I've got to learn to surf, and I've got to do all these things for retirement, right? It's got to be really special. Um, but, but Jesus is saying, what is the food that endures to eternal life? And so as um, John shares with you some key scriptures in a moment, think about the word as bread that nourishes us. I, I love the story of the famous English preacher of a century ago, Charles Spurgeon. He said that when you're presenting God's word to people, since it's bread, you know, present the bread, the word of God as bread, but, you know, spread a little butter on it as well. And actually, he said, it wouldn't hurt if there was a little bit of jam uh, along with it. We don't want this to be just um, uh, dry and theoretical, but something that's for our lives. So we're encouraged to feed on God's word. We're encouraged to regularly consume the word of God. It's a daily habit. And we're going to talk more about that. You know, we've got the pattern in the Old Testament. What an amazing picture. The uh, Israelites were to be sustained on this manna. And um, that was a daily uh, practice of uh, gathering and consuming and being nurtured and nourished by that. Uh, in this passage that we're talking about from John 6, uh, we've, we've got uh, the need uh, stressed by Jesus that his word is for us for day Today, living. I, I love the prayer. Maybe this could be uh, our prayer for how we hear God's word today. Uh, many years ago, Mary Lathbury put her hymn this way Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as you did break the loaves beside the sea. And then, this is an interesting part of her hymn Beyond the sacred page, you know, beyond just words and print and, and book, if you will or app, as we'll talk about later. Um, Beyond the sacred page, I seek you, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. So I hope that we're hungry for God's word. And, and John's now going to share with us sort of two main texts, but in particular, one main text that comes from uh, the book of Deuteronomy. <clears> okay. <throat> hey. Yeah, we're going to look at... Uh, Matthew 4, if you want to turn there, just uh, going to read verses 1 through 4. And, and I would say that, you know, the, when, we, when we think of metaphors, and especially today when we're, we're thinking about the metaphor of bread, um, don't, don't isolate it. It's, it's not just food, and it's not just um, pointing at something else. Think of the, the whole spectrum because God provides everything that we need. Um, he doesn't compartmentalize life the way we do. It's, it's all integrated. So anyway, let's, um, <clears throat> let's read Matthew. And what we want to do is, I, I want you to look for the parallels that we see. Uh, this, is, this is one of the main things that as, as you begin to read scripture, when you do, when you read it repeatedly, all of a sudden you're going to start seeing that there are certain things that are repeated, Old, New Testament, over and over again. But they have slightly different twists in certain places. That's, so it came to mind when, you were, when we were talking about rules. Um, I think the rule, especially with manna, is that even with God there are exceptions to the rule. You only collected it for six days. But it would go bad every day you collected it with the exception of the day before the Sabbath, when you weren't supposed to collect it. So even when God made rules, he said, there are exceptions to these rules, but you know what? Here's what they are. So Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
Now, if you have a study Bible of, of any sort, <clears throat> you'll note that that phrase is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And that's where I'd like to, to take us for a little while. So I'm going to read the first, uh, I believe it's three verses. Yeah. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'll give you a little bit of time to get there. That's, that's way at the beginning of your Bible. Um, <clears throat> If you like, turn left from where Matthew is. All right. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Yeah, I almost lost it there. Uh, all right. As I was reading... And I, I just want to give you an example. So as I was reading this week in my personal reading, um, I came across these verses that, that I thought, man, he, here's the same, here's a pattern. Here's a pattern that I see in Scripture. One comes from, don't bother turning there, I'll just read it quickly. Ezekiel chapter 3. And this is the sovereign Lord talking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Then the sovereign Lord said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you. And fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Now think of that, those words. And then listen to Exodus chapter 16, talking to these same people. Okay? The Lord of Israel, the, the people of Israel called the bread manna. And it was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Okay? That the Lord provided food for them in a place where they had no food. He provided water for them in a place where they had no water. And Deuteronomy is telling us exactly the same thing. And he's telling the people to remember. So a couple of the key terms I'd like to bring to your attention. So do you notice the, the pairing of two sets of words? There are two pairs, two sets of words. First, he says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that, here's the purpose, so that you may live, you may have life, and not just that you will have a meager existence, but that you will increase, that your knowledge of God will grow, that your faith in God will grow, that you will have an abundance within you that isn't tied to what's happening around you, but it is a, it is a, a, a firm and secure place. And then he says this pair, that you will enter and possess the land, okay? That you will enter and possess. This is not a temporary situation. This isn't a temporary dwelling. It isn't a, a passing phase. It's something where this is going to be permanent. This, this is going to be your home. You know, in my experience, I grew up in a single-parent family. We moved a lot. I went to three different schools in my first three years of public education. You know, I still have this sense of unrootedness. I don't really feel at home in most places. Uh, but where I do feel at home is when I am with a group of people worshiping as we are today. That's the place where I feel most at home. Where I feel like I, be, I belong here, this feels right. This feels like where I should be. You know what, as much as I, uh, Steve was asking, what do you feel thankful for? I, I felt thankful for two days ago we had three guests for dinner. They were all four-footed, mind you. And they were standing in the back of our property and I could see these deer. And they were beautiful. 
you know? And I'm thankful for things like that. The, the beauty of the creation around us astounds, continues to astound me. And I have done lots of hiking in the wilderness. And, you know, um, I, I can remember seeing blooms on the sides of mountains of tiny, tiny flowers. And you go back there two weeks later, nothing's there. You know? So I'm thankful for that. But I'm thankful that the Lord is saying, if you follow me, here, is my, here are my instructions to enter into a land that will never fade away, that will never perish, that is secured for you by your Lord Jesus Christ and by his ability to keep all of these commands and that he has given his life for you. So those four words that we will live and that we will increase <clears throat> that we will enter and that we will possess the land that is promised. But now I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> um, and if you talk to anybody in uh, our Bible study, which is also a great thing, Steve, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I love to ask questions because that's the way the Lord has dealt with me. You know, uh, I've been really convicted by some of the questions I've been asked. But listen to this. What did the people, how did the people hear? The people who heard this message from Moses, how did they respond? Were they obedient? Hey, okay, what do you think? Did they fail? Did they fail miserably? Well, about four to five hundred years later, the Lord took them into exile. They had failed so miserably. But you know what? He didn't disown them, did he? So with us, every time we fail, will the Lord disown us? No. He will always provide a way. He's always looking for a way to draw you to himself and to keep you moving along so you will live and increase, so that you will enter and possess the land he has promised you. So I'd just like to um, finish this section uh, <clears throat> with two short quotes. And I'm going to take off my glasses to read these. <clears throat> this is with regarding um, the land, okay? Through every stage of Israel's history, promise, conquest, possession, misuse, loss, and recovery, to speak of the land is to speak in terms of Israel's unique relationship with Yahweh. It was the place that guaranteed restored intimacy with God and promoted human flourishing in a new garden paradise. Okay? And that's our destiny. <clears throat> so, this is the repeated message of the Bible, that our God has and will continue to faithfully keep his promise to save, gather together, and provide a place for his people to live free from sin. And... I appreciate that um, emphasis on this land because, you know, we do, we do have the temptation to think of the Israelites uh, leaving the wilderness, crossing the Jordan, and into the land of promise. And isn't this a great uh, illustration of, you know, our life, our difficult life on earth, earth, and as many hymns say, you know, passing through the Jordan, and then we enter into heaven one day when we go to see Jesus. But really... We're thinking of the teaching that the, the, the promised land is that place of fullness in which we experience God, uh, we experience um, life in Christ, as we like to say at our church, uh, living the life of Jesus, sharing the life of Jesus. And so the, the scriptures lead us to that. So much of what God was doing in giving the scriptures was to lead into this place. Uh, the Bible uh, nourishes us, and then um, the Bible also nurtures us. That's another main thought we want to mention. Uh, if you want to turn, you're welcome to join me in Second uh, Timothy chapter three, and there we've got uh, the little bit of a an account of the interaction that Paul had uh, with Timothy. Well, really, a, a little bit about uh, Timothy's background. I was thinking. <laughs> um, uh, about something that, a way in which the Word of God shaped my life. I was reading yesterday um, the uh, Genesis account, 
And I was thinking about uh, experience in grade one. And in grade one, uh, our a teacher instructed us to write a creative story. I've never been that creative. In, um, to create a story, to try, uh, choose an animal, and why did they have that characteristic? You know, be very creative. Why did the giraffe have a long neck and so forth? And my story was very short. I, was, I remember being very indignant, even at, at six years of age. And I wrote, you know, the animals look this way because that's the way God made them. And then I handed in my assignment. Right? So God's word does, does shape us. And, and uh, I connect with Timothy, Timothy's experience because the scriptures were part of Timothy's growth. If you're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, at uh, verse uh, 14, we read this. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it, very similar to John's you know, testimony about uh, impactful people in his life, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture. So some of us have had that extreme privilege to have been brought up in, a, uh, in the heritage of the Scriptures. Which are, uh, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then Paul connects, you know, Timothy's personal experience with the Scripture with a truth for all of us. And this truth is that all Scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God. It's used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so Paul, in a very short space of time, you know, is summarizing what John has been sharing with us as this journey, this centuries-long journey of Israel to, to live in the fullness of their relationship with, with God. And the scriptures, God's principles, his, his instructions, all of those words we want to use um, are uh, the, the, the means by which he shapes us, leads us, guides us, and really nourishes us. I want to share with you what uh, we believe at Cornerstone. I don't know how often you go to our doctrinal statement. The statement we have, you can find it on, online, or you might have a copy at home. But as it relates to the Word of God, this is what our statement of faith says. We believe the Bible to be the complete Word of God, that the 66 books of the Old and New Testament in the original manuscripts were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we're entirely free from error. Further, we believe that the Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And so something that John and I have been uh, wrestling with is, you know, how do we um, ensure that we don't leave Scripture as, um, you know, textbook or th theory or, or just information but it's actually something that we have to embrace in our lives. We have to incorporate in our lives, or as John put it earlier, uh, that God's Word uh, shapes how we live. One of the interesting things about uh, this, you know, I, I just want to, you know, I, I want to give a shout out to Brent and thank him. You know what, I, I think, quite honestly, I think he's one of the most creative pastors when it comes to Sunday morning teaching I have ever met. You know, I have never done anything like this before. And what I enjoy about it is he, he missed a phrase that he wrote, and I thought, you know, that's, that's something we need to make sure people hear. He said, we need to embrace and engage with Scripture. And I like that terminology. You know, I, I like it especially if, um, if you're of my vintage, I don't know how many of you, I, I never was one for cars. I am for motorcycles though, but so um, <clears throat> mechanically speaking, you know, you think of it, you know, you embrace an automobile or it embraces you, but unless you engage it, unless you put it in gear, you're not gonna go anywhere. You're not gonna get, you know, you're not gonna appreciate that machine. In the same sense, but, but with far greater value, unless we embrace Scripture, unless we, we let it into our lives, and unless we engage it and we begin to live what it does, we, we begin to follow the way it shapes us, we won't receive any of that value. 
And, <clears throat> and so uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about that from Deuteronomy. Okay, so back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now, it's interesting that in Deuteronomy, in the first verse, we hear those four words, right? Live and increase, enter and possess. But then it goes on to talk about that process, which is very interesting. I'm going to reread uh, verses 2 through 5. Remember. Okay, I'm going to emphasize the words that I want you to remember. Okay, remember how the Lord your God led you, right? All the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you, okay? Think of anything that you've done in your life that has required some skill or some stamina. You didn't just come the first day and do it. You had to train. You had to be tested. You had to test yourself, right? So, he humbled you to test you in order to know what was in your heart so that you could examine yourself. You could see what, what really is in me. What do I really value as opposed to what God values? Whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger. Notice that. Now, remember I asked you to pay attention for parallels? Jesus had been fasting for 40 days, and where did the Spirit of God, or this, and who led him there? The Spirit of God, right? Led him into a period where he would be hungry. And here's the same experience in the people of God. Moses is telling them, he's led you these 40 years to humble you, right? Causing you to be hungry. And then feeding you. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of, God, of the Lord. And then look at, look at this. Now, this is what I mean by, you know, when we talk about bread as a metaphor, it's not just food. Look at this passage. What, what does he say in the next verse, right? About the 40 years of their journey in the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell during these 40 years. And that's the one thing I've noticed about age. And I used to do a fair amount of hiking. I did a 150-mile hike in 10 days, right? And my feet didn't swell. Mind you, I was, you know, I don't know, 20-something. <laughs> I can't spend a day at work. I still work three days a week where my legs don't swell. You know, I come home, take off my boots, and I go, oh, gee, I got fat legs and real skinny ankles. You know? And yet for 40 years, these people walked in the desert. So you imagine, all the people who were 20 years, of, 20 years old or older died in the wilderness. So imagine if you were 19, you would now be 59, and you're entering into the promised land. But your feet didn't swell, your clothes didn't wear out. You saw all this provision of the Lord. So then what does he do? He makes a concluding statement in verse 5. <clears throat> know then. This is what are you supposed to learn from this? Know this. Right? In your heart, that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Now, we don't like words like that, especially in our culture. But I'm thankful for the discipline I've received from God. Just like the psalmist in Psalm 119, right? I'm glad that I was afflicted so that I might learn your word, right? Because it's going to lead me to life, right? So know this. Know that the Lord, in spite of our failure, will provide for us what we need to reach the goals he has for us, to bring us into his kingdom, that he will correct us, and he will make multiple course corrections for us. He will move us at times when we want to stop, but he will change our course as we are moving as well. He will continually do that. Again, I want to, I want to read a short passage to you just to, to point out to you how this occurs in all sorts of parts of the scripture. And again, it's 
from a reading that I did last week in my own personal reading. It comes from the book of Lamentations. And something that struck me a little while ago, but still I, I constantly like remembering things like this, is that this isn't Lamentations that, oh, I'm having a tough time. Do you know what the writer of Lamentations, Jeremiah, is talking about when he, when he talks about lamenting? Anybody? Go ahead, answer if you do know. Huh? You know, he's talking about his sin. He's lamenting because of his own heart. Right? And the effects it has had on the people of Jerusalem and the fact that now they have been exiled. Okay, all of those things. But it includes him lamenting for his own sin. Listen to this from Lamentations 3.19. Now, part of this is very familiar, I'm sure, to many of you. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I said to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. I'm hopeful that... Um, the next time you have, and I'm going to try and describe it as briefly as possible, you know, the, the, the oven door opens and you first get the smell and then, and then you reach in and out comes the bread and it's kind of steaming and then, you know, when you pull it apart and then you slather the butter on it and then to honor um, uh, tr uh, our speaker, the quote I mentioned, put some jam on it. It's got to be I'm, I'm in a raspberry jam phase of my life right now. Okay. So the next time you bite into some bread, um, I, I hope some of these thoughts are coming back to mind, that God wants to nurture us, God wants to nourish us. This journey that uh, John has been describing for us, this journey, notice, I, ho I hope that really comes out, how... Um, integrated in that journey of getting into a deeper place with Jesus, it's about his word. We're going to talk more, you know, in the next two weeks about how Jesus is the living word, and next week we'll tackle um, this topic with the idea that uh, the, the, the word picture of light, uh, thinking of the scripture as a light and what that does in our lives. But um, we're, now it's homework time, right? So... <laughs> Um, a lot of this started uh, probably a, a month or six weeks ago. John and I just met for coffee, and, and um, we were talking about Bible reading apps and reading through the Bible, and so all this kind of has bubbled out of that. And so what we want to really encourage you to do is be involved in Bible reading, obviously. First, uh, one step that you might want to take is if you want to go to uh, Digging Deeper, and then the uh, sermon notes, you know, all of the scriptures and the quotes are in there. So if you want to read that again. But there's a, a, a final page, which is actually out of a book um, by Howard and William Hendricks called Living by the Book. And it's just a self-analysis. You can read through that and answer the questions. It's just to, to kind of get a sense of how do I feel about reading God's word. So you can use that little tool in there. Uh, and then uh, the homework, the main homework, is that we're encouraging you today to launch into a Bible reading plan. If you were on uh, Facebook, uh, you saw this already advertised. We're launching a Bible reading plan for our congregation. Well, how, how do we do that? And um, the, the way we do that is online. And so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, I know a dozen, about a dozen already are signed up uh, or have, have designated uh, on version, which is one of, there's many excellent Bible apps. I have another whole sort of Bible library that I use uh, but uh, on my phone. But, but this is version, and it's a very easy download. If you're already on version, we'll go to the next slide. All you need to do is, uh, once you've downloaded the app, is go to the Discover, 
And then you just search for Cornerstone Neighborhood Church, and then when you find it, you just set it as my church. And then uh, whenever we launch a Bible reading plan, which we've just done uh, on Friday, uh, the one that I showed you, uh, then uh, you can see that that's the plan for our church. And you can um, participate in that. And we, we understand you might already be in a great um, pattern habit of getting into God's Word, so we don't want to disrupt that. But if you want to join in, um, that app will just take you day by day. So yesterday I started it, and so as a result, that's why it was in the Genesis account. But it'll take us through the Word of God just on a systematic basis uh, over a, a one-year period. So I really encourage you to get involved in that. Uh, some of the dreaming that John and I have been doing, we were thinking at our home group Bible studies, like, what if, uh, you know, everybody's reading this passage, right? And then, and then it's just this organic, hey, what were you reading? Were you reading this week? Yeah, what spoke to me was this. And it's, you know, as we're nurtured, even John said a couple times, you know, here's what I studied to prepare, right? But in my own personal reading, it, 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 it bolstered that. And I, I had a similar experience, you know, as well. And so as we uh, get into God's Word, it nurtures us, it feeds us, and we just encourage you to be, be in God's Word. So thanks, John, for this. And you're going to hear uh, from both of us again over the next couple weeks. If you have any questions at all about the app, if it's simple, talk to me. If it's complicated, find someone younger. Um, <laughs> you know, I once, I once had one of my millennial children say to me, Dad, just because I'm a millennial doesn't mean I know everything about computers. And I thought, well, that's strange. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to call on, on Cam to come and lead us in our uh, closing song. And uh, thanks again, John. <laughs>